Hello, this is Palico Pudge, and welcome back to another Sleepy Sunday Let's Play with the game, The Away Team. And we're not doing too badly, all in all. Everybody's alive. We managed to get a little bit of food at the end of the last episode, but we don't tell the crew on where that food came from. They don't need to know stuff like that. It's enough to know that they're drinking their own pee, and it's been recycled several times. It's starting to taste a bit like Dutch beer. It's that bad. But by the by, we are here on Gallon 6F. This is where we, we left it last time. And uh, let's crack straight on in, shall we? So this is a star class G. I have no idea what that means. Uh, it is a planet. Sub -te super Terran. Super Terran. Uh, surface temperature error. That, that can't be good. That must be super duper hot or super duper cold. Either way, not good. Habitability is error too. Hmm. What should we do? Let's read, shall we? Summary. Sensors are not getting a good reading on this planet, and there's nowhere to land a shuttle anyway, so it's impossible to send the crew down. You detach the shuttle for a quick excursion to scoop up some raw materials. Oh, let's do this. So, there are two spots where it seems like you might have a good chance at harvesting fuel. You only have time for one of them, however, and in either case, it's going to be a very quick pass. Okay, so... Where do we want to go? We've got the temperate zone in the troposphere, or we have the south polar region in the thermosphere. Well, I think the thermosphere sounds like a much nicer place. It almost contradicts itself, because polar says cold, thermo says warm. Let's do that. Back on the ship, Cora Emma volunteers to remote pilot the shuttle. They get in trouble a few times, but immediately ask for your help. By flying with the airlock open, the shuttle scoops up a sample of hopefully useful gas then heads quickly back to the ship. By the time it docks, the onboard drones have compressed the gas into a usable form of fuel. Nice. And uh, everyone's still alive, so that is a win-win. Very quick start on that, on that one. Hopefully, this next planet is going to have a little bit more to it, but no doubt we'll see in a second. Our food is running low again. That's not good. Uh, so this looks better. The Oh, it's very cold. It's very cold. I have to put your thermals on here, I'm afraid. Uh, summary, there are signs of life on this otherwise apparently barren planet, although it's not quite clear what form it takes. The atmosphere is not entirely hospitable to humans, nor indeed any Earth animal you know of, but the sensors indicate that something is definitely down there. Regardless, it's also clear enough that humans, or something like them, were here in the past. You wouldn't know it from the lack of anything in orbit around the planet, but sandwiched between several tall mountain ranges on the surface is the ruins of what might once have been a small city. Well, we'd better get down there and see what the bloody hell's going on. Right, so this time around we need a leader, medic and engineer than anybody else who we feel might be up for the task. So with that being said, I suppose we'd better take Cora. She's our scientist. Uh, who? It's Michael, isn't it, who's our surgeon yeah so you're a medic you're straight in there and where was our mechanic Eric 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 and uh, then we've got ah he's our uh, sort of generic guy should we take him Osmin should Osmin come along uh, we still need a leader I think it was Keelan wasn't it, it was the politician but he is reckless that's that's generally not good Let's take Cora. Cora can be our leader, and we better take a soldier along because you never know. You might need a xenophobe. That's all I'm saying. Sometimes a little bit of xenophobia goes a long way. We'll leave that there, I think. <laughs> so let's deploy. Right. So there's some sort of energy signature down there, you tell the crew, is that the shuttle closes in on the surface. It's not entirely clear what it is, but it's well worth checking out, even if this place doesn't exactly look like home. The signal is not steady, whatever it is. It pulses, and the readings from the shuttle sensors rise and fall as it manoeuvres between mountain tops and crumbling old buildings. When the shuttle breaks into a clearing at the centre of the city, however, the signal becomes more steady. It's clearly coming from below the ground, directly underneath a spindly tower or statue of some sort that straddles the entire clearing. Plenty of places to land, take your pick. The streets of what was once a city are overgrown with scraggly red and black plants, tangled vines and scary looking thorn bushes, but there's ample room against the floor for a safe landing. Sensors are clearly detecting life below the surface, you say. It's impossible to tell what. It's organic, it's mobile, that's about all I know. Probably not a plant, but no way to be sure. Could be intelligent, could be dangerous, especially since you're not armed. 
If you get into trouble, immediately run back to the shuttle. Cora Emma opens the shuttle door and the crew heads out into the clearing. The undergrowth here is about shin deep, but despite the scary looking thorns, you're confident that an atmospheric suit will be able to withstand whatever it comes into contact with. Beneath the razor grass and thorny weeds is a quite flat and sturdy surface, apparently made of some sort of stone reinforced with metal rebar based on your scans. Clearly artificial, but then the buildings and giant metal tower already give that away. There are hollow spaces below, but they're more tunnel than cavern. There are still no better readings on whatever non-plant life forms might be down there. Perhaps the crew will be able to avoid contact entirely. That would be ideal. If you had breath, you wouldn't be holding it, however. So we can search the nearby buildings or we can go straight down below underneath the metal tower. Let's scope out what's going on around this hole in the ground and then we'll take it from there. I think that's the best thing. There might be scary things on the surface we have to deal with yet. So search the nearby buildings. The buildings are certainly in line with what you might have expected humans to produce. They're rectangular, the majority being taller than they are wide, and the windows and doors are of similar proportions. The exact purpose of these structures is impossible to discern, however. The exteriors contain no signs of other indications of function, and the interiors, at least those the crew checks out, have been stripped clean of everything but walls, ceilings and floors. Not even any furniture, says Cora Emma. It's like it was all built for people who never showed up. Or else, if there was anyone here, they took everything with them that they, when they left. Hundreds, thousands, maybe millions of years ago? Who knows? Somewhat curiously, none of the buildings that the crew checks have any means of accessing levels below the surface. There are certainly signs of foundations and utility corridors and the like, but there isn't a single staircase or elevator to be found. Not so much as a trap door with a suspiciously convenient ladder to descend. Ultimately, the crew abandons the search of the interiors, and the search turns to the open area near where the shuttle landed. The dense undergrowth makes the search difficult, but the plant life is low enough to the ground that the crew feels somewhat safe spreading out a bit. Now that they're looking a bit more closely, it becomes clear that there are soft spots in the terrain, areas where the stony surface is covered instead in scattered rubble and small dirt mounds. Arik Pritz suddenly stops and holds up their hand. Hold it, everyone, they say. Everyone stops for a minute, and at first there's nothing noticeable. Then, from somewhere near the base of the old tower, there's a definite skittering and rustling in the bushes, as if something there was scurrying away from the crew. See, I knew it! I knew it! Quick, see what that is! The crew rushes over, headlamps on full brightness, and they just manage to catch a glimpse of a small, hairless albino creature, its hindquarters disappearing into a small hole in the earth. There wasn't much to see, but it was in view long enough to determine that it was about the size of a cat, with a rat-like tail and very long claws on its hind feet. Cora Emma instructs everyone to turn the lights on their helmets to full brightness and focus on the area around the tower. It isn't long before Michael Rennick... Or was that Michelle? Mikau? Mikau will go for. Mikau Rennick finds something. Barely visible beside one of the legs of the tower is a small metal hatch, nearly invisible beneath the foliage. After a few minutes of clearing, the hatch is pulled back, revealing a narrow staircase descending into darkness. Well, I guess we're doing it. Ask the crew to investigate the staircase cautiously. The crew walks down the steps carefully. The path that they... We'll start that again. The crew walks down the steps carefully, the path before them well lit by their headlamps. The stone stairs are unremarkable, as are the landings, spaced out every five metres or so with the corridor taking a 90 degree turn to the left each time. There are no railings, signs, doorways or lights anywhere and the purpose of this stairwell is uncertain. After a dozen or so landings, the walls of the stairwell begin to show signs of decay and disruption. Rather than being smooth and unblemished, there are pockmarks of various sizes, the majority large enough to stick an arm into. From within these holes comes a rustling sound, punctuated by periods of rapid skittering, as of claws on stone. Something is in there, moving around. Fallen Stabler narrows their eyes and approaches one of the holes cautiously. Suddenly, they reach inside the hole and grab at whatever is inside. There's a squeal, almost too high pitched for human ears to perceive, and then a sudden silence. Fallen Stabler pulls their hand out and drops something to the ground. It's one of the albino creatures, clearly dead its head and neck crushed. Clearly they don't have very dense bone structure, they say, but they do seem to be pretty meaty. Perhaps we can catch some for food. Ooh. Now, do we mess with 
the local fauna, I presume it would be. Yeah, because flora's plants. Fauna. Do we kill a few, get a bit more food, which generally we do need, or do we let them be and see what else is, is, is carrying on? It's a difficult one. It's a difficult one. Then again, we do have a xenophobe with us, so let's kill them. That's not a bad idea, you tell the crew. We can always use more material for the food replicators. Don't get carried away, but if you get can get some more of them, maybe bring back a few armfuls. Armfuls? That's quite a few. <laughs> the crew goes to work as they descend, reaching in and grabbing those small creatures foolish enough to poke their heads out or scurry closer to the surface. They don't seem to suffer too much, though. They do give off their little squeals at the end. Heartbreaking. Ultimately, the staircase reaches a final landing, at which point you estimate the crew is probably 100 metres below the surface. By this point, the walls are completely Swiss cheesed with holes of various sizes. Fortunately, there must be enough structural metal in place to keep the entire thing from collapsing. If the creatures are as active as it appears, it's certainly strong enough that the crew isn't going to cause any further harm. The bottom of the staircase empties into a small antechamber of some sort. There are no doors between this and the next room, but it's clearly a separate space. The doorway features a lowered arch, above which are carved some sort of sigils or pictograms. They're somewhat difficult to make out, however. Eric Pritz takes a closer look at the carvings above the doorway. These are very primitive, they say. Very strange. I'd almost say that whoever carved these had nothing to do with the buildings on the surface, or even the staircase. The level of sophistication is completely different. Any conclusions, anybody? Eric Pritz shrugs. Hard to say, really. There are clearly some people here of various sizes. Small, medium, some giant-sized. This here might be a chair, or a throne of some sort. If we were on Earth and this was, say, ancient Egyptian, I say that these were slaves serving a pharaoh of some sort of god. Or some sort of god. But who knows? So, do we want to go in or shall we run off with our food? Well, it'd be rude not to have a look now, I suppose. And so far, we've been able to deal with the local wildlife, so let's, let's crack on, shall we? Your crew didn't walk all the way down here for nothing. You instruct them to explore further. Maybe they can find the origin of this strange signal. The crew enters the large chamber, scanning about curiously with their headlamps to reveal a roughly circular room approximately 50 metres in diameter and half again as high. The floor slopes down gently towards the centre of the room, with its lowest point being about 2 metres or so below ground level. At the lowest point is a dais, three stone steps leading up to a circular platform that appears to be some sort of platform. <laughs> okay. Uh, the walls of the room are encrusted with what appears to be rather intricate murals, although the potential effect is diminished somewhat by the activities of the subterranean creatures burrowing. Cora Emma appears uncertain what to do. What do you suggest, they ask? Shall we investigate the murals or check the days? Well. It's only a platform, so let's check out the murals, I suppose, and then we'll come back to the days. You instruct the team to look at the mules first, but Fallen Stabler shakes their head. We need to focus on finding that signal or whatever. There's nothing these creatures have that we want otherwise, and frankly I'd rather avoid any more of them. They might have space rabies or something. You're going to eat them, aren't you? Space rabies is not a thing, you say. Yeah, well, maybe it will be one of those things bites one of us, they say. You can't know that. Thin as it is, Fallen Stabler makes a convincing enough argument, and the crew heads immediately towards the dais at the centre of the room. You can almost imagine the creatures in the walls breathing a sigh of relief. The crew takes a moment to themselves, and you let them have it. It's not like they can break out a, panic, a picnic lunch and play cards, but you let them mull about for a moment. Not for too long, though. Don't want them getting the idea that this is home. This planet has its temptations, but it's not suitable for long-term habitation. Clearly, whoever was here before found a good reason to leave. You hope the crew doesn't find that same reason. Alright, let's look at the dais. The crew stumbles a bit as they approach the centre of the room due to the incline. But it's not so bad and even if someone fell, the worst that would happen is they'd slide gently for a few seconds. The dais itself has three steps, or four if you include the rounded pedestal at the top. Somewhat concave, it, like the chamber around it, slopes down towards the centre. There are a few chips and scratches here and there, but overall the entire arrangement looks very solid. There's no sign of any mechanism or special function. Kara Emma asks, what should we do? So should they look at the top of the dais, look at the sides of the dais, or abandon the mission? Let's look at the side. There might be something written on each side of the step. 
Working on the assumption that there might be something underneath the dais, you instruct the crew to look around the sides of, for any sort of mechanism that might give more information about its function. After a few minutes of poking around, the crew gets the impression that the dais itself is capable of rotating. It looks like it would take an incredible amount of strength to turn it. Falling stabler looks Falling Stabler is up to the challenge, however. They step forward, brace themselves as much as possible, and heave as hard as they can. For a few seconds, it seems as if they'll do nothing but break their back. But, they su but then suddenly the dais shifts. They stumble forward a bit and catch their balance, quickly stepping back. The dais begins to shake and rattle as it rotates, seemingly unscrewing to reveal a thin silver light around the bottom that grows brighter by the moment. After a minute or two, the dais has finished rotating, leaving a gap about a metre high beneath the top and centre rings, from which a bright unnatural light flickers gently. The radio signal you had detected earlier is much stronger now, so this is clearly the source. Well, let's see what's under it then, I guess. You tell the crew to check out the signal under the dais and they do so. It's some sort of device, says Cora Emma. It's metal and it's got lights on it, about a metre around. It's kind of warm. You can tell most of this from the camera feed, of course, but you don't mention that to the crew. If you can lift it, do so, you say. We have no way of knowing what that can do, but maybe it'll be a fuel source. Not going to be able to tell down here. The crew manages to wrestle de the device loose, at which point both the light and the radio signal immediately cease. With the light from the their helmet lamps, however, they are able to navigate their way out of the chamber and back up to the surface, unmolested. It's always good to not be molested, I find. Wood safely on the surface, the crew sets the device down briefly to figure out how best to move it. Rolling it seems plausible, but might damage it. Ultimately, they decide that just carrying it to the shuttle is wisest. The alien corpses are somewhat worthy of study, but after dismantling one and scanning everything into your systems, there's no reason not to just recycle the rest for food, which you do without bothering to consult the crew. An analysis of the radio-emitting device the crew retrieved reveals some fascinating properties. It was clearly not the work of the primitive creatures on the surface, and appears to have made, been made by human hands at some point, based on the markings inside. There's no telling how old it was, or its exact purpose, but it's definitely more advanced than what was available on Earth when your ship departed, and as such, it's more advanced than you would ever have on board. There are a few things you might be able to do with this thing. It could be converted into a significantly qu quantity of raw fuel, if you wanted to completely dismantle it. You could also slightly improve the ship's scanners by incorporating some of the transmitters into your own systems, although this would require using some of the most significant sources of fuel, so only one or the other would work. Well, I think we're doing okay for fuel at the moment, so let's improve the ship's scanners, shall we? So we've got 30, oh, we've got 30 feud, uh, feud, feud, 30 food off that, which is awesome. Our sensor range has also increased, which is tip top, and we didn't lose anyone. So I would say that has been win, win. Uh, with that being said, let's uh, jump off, shall we? On to the next. Oh, we have Le Guin 49. Looks rocky and hot. 30 degrees Celsius. That's a good temperature. That is a good temperature. The atmosphere of this planet is completely unsuitable for human life, or indeed any form of life you can think of. In fact, it might very well be comparable with what Earth's atmosphere likely looks like at this point, choked with toxic gases. Beneath the dense, dark cloud, however, there's definitely a solid surface and a very good chance of finding some sort of fuel for the ship, even if sending the crew down to look around is a risk. It's a calculated one. All oh, right, looks like we're sending people down then. So, uh, well, last time worked out well. So let's take the usuals. Uh, Michael was my surgeon. Eric, my mechanic. I think we're going to take Osmin. No, we're not going to take Osmin because he's strong along with Fallen. So I think that'll be okay. We'll take Keelan. Why not? Let's take a bigger crew this time around. Right, all the sensors' readings are a bit strange, admittedly. Everything indicates that there's no possible way anything is live down there, and yet some of the results are in line with what you'd expect to see if life forms were present. There were Earth creatures who lived in some pretty inhospitable environments. Certain worms, bacteria, and the like thrived at the bottom of the ocean around geothermal vents, for example. If there's anything down there, it's probably something like that. So as long as the crew keeps their suits on, they should be just fine. 
Surely the biggest challenge, however, will be finding a place to set the shuttle down safely. Once inside the atmosphere, it becomes clear that the planet is very geothermically active, and much of the terrain is covered in molten rock that's hot enough to melt important pieces of the shuttle within a few minutes of setting down. You instruct the crew to find one of the poles, as they do appear a bit cooler and more stable, and they adjust course accordingly. So, do we want to hike to the northern pole or approach to the southern pole? Hmm... Let's go see Santa, Northern Pole. Your crew, led by Cora Emma, managed, manages to find a decent spot for the shuttle to land after a few passes. They select a high plateau overlooking a narrow valley, choked with what at first glance looks like something halfway between dirty water and tar, or perhaps molasses. The ambient temperature outside is high enough to keep whatever it is flowing rather freely. However, in fact a small stream of, of the stuff trickles past the shuttle about 100 meters out before running off the side of a cliff in a sort of tar fall. As the crew vacates the shuttle, albeit with some reluctance, they find the terrain solid and safe enough, It's a bit, if a bit sticky. Bits of the black gold flex stuff cling to the bottom of the crew's boots, but appears to pose no harm to either crew or suit. It will probably take a bit of effort to wash off however. Reading for en ready for anything even. Cora Emma looks around, but sees nothing of particular interest, so they throw the decision to you. Sensors show nothing in the immediate area, so it's, it's exploration no matter what. The crew could investigate the Tari stream in the distance, or search for a way to descend into the valley where there might be more to look at. Well, I'd presume once we've checked out the Tari stream, we'll be able to descend into the valley anyway, so let's check out the Tari stream first. From a distance, the stream the crew saw looked almost like a fast-flowing stream of dirty runoff, or perhaps even raw sewage, but up close it's clearly much thicker, almost tar-like. Sensor readings detect a number of things, but most important among them is the presence of hydrocarbons. If the crew can concoct some way to collect some of this material, they could transport enough back to the ship to help replenish the food replicator. Oh, nice. As is, this stuff is neither nutritious nor appealing, but as raw starter material, it's as good as anything else. Cora Emma suggests that the crew might be able to repurpose some of the spare atmospheric suits on the shuttle to carry some of the substance. They're watertight and impervious to just about everything, they, you, they say, and seeing as we don't exactly have any buckets lying around, they're probably our best option. The crew manages to find two spare suits on the shuttle and fills them up with the blackish gold goop sealing them shut before stowing them on board. Cara Emma has nothing more to offer about the current situation. Reading's all normal, so keep at it. Michael Rennick analyses some of the material more closely. Based on the chemical analysis and the material's density, they say, we might want to focus on collecting samples from deeper below the surface of this stream or whatever. It might be more rich in whatever it's rich in. It's impossible to tell whether or not this makes a difference, but the crew does it anyway since it doesn't seem like a bad idea. The crew looks around for a while, but finds nothing of interest that they haven't already taken note of, and or sampled in some fashion. You better keep your eyes peeled then. They're just about to turn back to the shuttle when there's a strange sound nearby, a cross between a rumble and a squelch, as if someone had dropped a wet thousand kilogram sponge off a tall building. When they turn to look, they see a giant humanoid form has clearly erupted from the ground, formed from the tar-like sludge. It has no visible face, but a head and arms can clearly be made out. Whether it's mocking or mimicking the human form, or this is its natural shape, it's unclear. What quickly becomes evident, however, is that it's intelligent because it begins to communicate with the crew. Are you hearing this, says Cora Emma? You respond negatively. I think it's using some sort of telepathy, they continue. I can hear it in my head. I know it's ridiculous, but still. Tell me what it's saying and I can, I can insist, damn it! It's angry that we're here, says Cora Emma, and it wants to know what we think we're doing. Tell it you're looking for food, tell it you're looking for fuel, tell it that it's none of its business, or ignore it. It's probably not any real threat. Well, if it's come up into human form and is telepathically talking to my crew, I would say it's probably a threat. So it's probably best not to ignore it or tell it it's none of its business. As it stands, we have what would appear to be food within the tar which we've collected. So I think we should just stick to that in case it can sense lies or whatnot. So tell it you're looking for food. Cara Emma relays the response and then listens intently for a few minutes. You almost wonder if they're hallucinating. 
Telepathy isn't something you thought was possible. Of course, it's a hallucination and they're still managing to, to communicate. Then maybe it doesn't matter if it's me mental communication or not. A lot can be conveyed through chemicals, subsonic transmissions and so on. There are plenty of ways to reach a brain short of the paranormal. It says it will let us have all the food we need, says Cora Emma, but only if we agree to do something for it. What does it want? They go on to explain and translate for several minutes, explaining that the creature wants another creature defeated. Apparently the entire planet is somehow under the control of just two sentient being, beings, and despite how large it is, the planet's just not big enough for both of them. Sure, I guess, says Cora Emma. It takes you a second to realise that they weren't addressing you. They were talking to the creature. Oh. <laughs> okay. No. Wait. Ask it. <laughs> Before you can ask the crew to reply, the creature appears to dissolve into the ground once again. Apparently, it assumes the crew will comply. So, uh, I sort of might have implied consent. So, now what do we do? Asks Cora Emma. Under normal circumstances, you imagine a decision like this wouldn't even be a consideration, but the crew hasn't really been under normal circumstances since the day you all left Earth. Weird situations were bound to occur. So we can go and fight the other creature, I suppose, or we can get the hell out of there. Ugh. The thing is, we don't know what the other creature's been doing. And I'm scared. If I choose to fight the creature, it's not going to give me the opportunity to actually look into what that creature is standing for and who might be the good guy around all this. But curiosity is getting the better of me. So I suppose we better go and see what they want. Leaving the planet without exhausting every option for survival would be short-sighted. If the crew needs to be do something like this to ensure their own survival, then maybe it's fine. Morality isn't something you consider a factor, especially not when it comes to alien beings of questionable sentience. Better they kill an alien creature and get some food than kill one another. I agree, I agree. The crew returns to the shuttle, but before they can get a chance to board or prepare further, two creatures made of sludge and tar rise up in front of them blocking their path. If there are any differences between the two, they are not apparent. Uh, Houston, we have a problem, says Cora Emma. The one on the left seems to be upset that we agreed to fight it, and the one on the right is saying it's upset that we're not fighting the other one yet. They're bickering like children, except in our heads, not using words. Cora Emma goes on to explain that the one on the left seems to be, man to be demanding that the crew pre prepare for a physical struggle, the likes of which they have never seen imagined before. Or something like that, which they have never before imagined. Keenan Visa suggests that the crew might try to get them to fight each other instead, then sneak away in the confusion. So, before it can react, rush it and attack. Maybe try to battle it mentally, or try to make them argue with each other. I would like to get them to argue with each other. I don't think there's any need to get involved with this. If we can have it that way. But then again, they are both aiming their annoyances at us right now. Um, we do have the strength of the soldier here in Fallen Stabler. But do I want to try and sacrifice them for it? It's a difficult one. It's a difficult one. Let's try and get them to argue with each other first. Let's try and play, play, this, play this off coolly, I think. You tell the crew to not play this game anymore. If the creatures have a problem with each other, let them fight it out. The crew may die, but they will not die as the playthings of some sadistic alien tarball. Both creatures seem taken aback at this, and they dissolve into puddles. A moment later, the two puddles coalesce, and a single creature appears, twice as tall. They're the same creature, says Cora Emma. Indeed, it makes sense. You run some more scans. Now, more focused now that you know what you're looking for, and the results confirm your suspicions. The entire planet is covered in the same black goop almost equally. Though at various depths, there are not two or more creatures on this planet, there is only one. The creature is the creature, one symbiotic whole. They're not sure what the game was exactly. Or well, we're not sure what the game was exactly, but you're sure it's over. You order the crew to board the shuttle. As they do so, the creature deposits some of its material outside the door. A going away gift? A booby prize? Who knows? The crew accepts it, regardless. No sense leaving behind something that might prove useful. The crew is relieved when the shuttle finally reconnects to the ship, and they don't even bother to eat or clean up before collapsing into their bunks to decompress. You can only assume they're thinking the same thing you are, that this was some sort of test. As they too are wondering if they passed or failed. I would say we passed! 
we got food nobody died either us or on the on the planet and uh, we we get to fight another day so i'd i'd say that's a win personally and uh, we better crack on to the next planet we got loads of food now food is not an issue anymore oh but this may be and uh, i think this is where we shall leave this episode uh, we've we've had a couple of run-ins We've gathered some food. Food is not an issue now. And we're going to be looking at another rocky, hot planet. Uh, or cold planet, this is, this is. Minus 40 degrees Celsius. Jeez. Proper chilly, this one. Proper chilly. But we'll we'll look into this on the next episode. So thank you for watching. As always, a like is appreciated. And I'll catch you on the next Sleepy Sunday. Take it easy.